So, in today's video... Huh? You forgot your apron. Is that acceptable? Looks great. Yeah, okay. You are not going to want to skip through today's video because I'm going to be giving away a massive signed print of Moon Glow. And I'm also going to be giving away a signed copy of my book Chasing Awe with Gavin Hardcastle. And I'm also going to be giving away some trade secrets on how I print my images. So if you've ever wanted to print your own photography, hit like, hit subscribe, tickle my bell, and let's get cracking. So why would you want to bother printing your own photography? Well, to me, it boils down to two things, and that is satisfaction and self-improvement. I don't think there's anything more satisfying for a photographer than to see your image in print. Now, I'm willing to bet that most photographers, they spend the majority of their time looking at a particular image only during the editing process. And then once you've finished, you post that image online and pretty much forget about it. But when you put your image in print, it's the opposite way around. When you look at it, you don't think about the editing process. You might not even think that much about the shooting process. What you're thinking about when you study your own art on a wall is you're thinking about that moment. You're thinking about how it felt, how it smelt, was it cold? Was it warm? You're back in that place, experiencing that memory again. And print does that in a way that I feel, looking at your images on screen or on a phone, it just doesn't even compare. The other benefit of printing and hanging your own photography is self-improvement. And so that can come in the form of technical ability, or even artistic ability. So in, in terms of technical ability, often I will notice imperfections in a print that's hung on a wall that I, for whatever reason, I missed when I was editing it on screen. It could be a dust spot. It could even be a raindrop on the lens. For whatever reason, I don't quite catch these as well on screen as I do when I print something large and then stick it on the wall. And then also artistically and creatively, when you look at how your images perform, especially in a large space, you can start to see holes in your game. You can start to see areas of improvement that you could make in terms of your compositions and your choice of subject matter. Well, before I get into the next bit, um, a lot of you were a bit worried about the state of my camera from last week's video. And, um, well, it's fine. It turned out all right. So I've used it since and it, it filmed video and it, it shot stills fine. So I think so far it's fine, which is good because I don't have any insurance. So if I've managed to talk you into printing your own images, well, where do you start? What are your choices? Well, you've got two choices. You can either print it yourself in your own little humble print lab, which is basically what I've got going on here, or you can send it away to a much bigger print lab that will offer far more services. So there's pros and cons to both of those options. Now, what I like about doing it myself for small prints, such as these 11 by 14s, which are on sale right now, there's a link in the description. What I like is that I can check every single print straight off the press. I can then sign it and I just send it direct to the client. You're not disconnected from the creation process. And also you can do things like I did in my last video where if you have a particular artistic goal in mind, you can go and shoot that shot, come back home, print it and have it hanging on the wall the same day. You can't do that with a remote print lab. So I do love that hands-on, creative process. To me, it's all part of the creative process. But of course, clients will always want something that you just can't provide in your own little humble print lab. And that's when it's really good to be able to send it away to a lab and have them make something huge or something really technically difficult to make, such as an acrylic or an aluminium or a canvas. Those are things that I just couldn't do here in my own little print lab. So I actually use both of those options. Now I'm going to give you a little trade secret here and uh, I wish I was getting like an affiliate kickback for this, but uh, I'm not. Um, yeah, I could have made some money there. But the remote print lab that I use usually is Whitewall and they're in Germany. And even though they're in Germany, they can still ship prints far, far cheaper than I can here in Canada. So 
they can do pretty much anything and then another one that I've never actually used before but I've been to their lab and I've looked at their work and it was fantastic while I was there was Nevada art printers down in obviously Nevada so those are two options that you might want to look at if you want to do a massive print or acrylics or a very posh high-end frame for a client but otherwise if it's smaller than 24 inches on the short side I'll print these at home in my own little humble print lab. So now we'll talk about the printer, but before I do that, remember earlier I mentioned that I'm giving away a signed print, massive, 24 by 36 of Moonglow. So if you want a chance of winning that in a prize draw that I'm gonna do probably next week or next month, I don't know when I'm gonna do it, but I'll, I'll, I'll do it. There's a link in the description to the mailing list. Sign up to the mailing list and your name will automatically get entered into a prize draw for a chance to win that signed print. Well, that's a good deal. That's a brilliant deal. Because these aren't cheap, are they? No, they're not cheap. <laughs> they're, not, they're not cheap. Could this signed print end up hanging on your wall? Well, you might get lucky. So the printer, and uh, this is the printer that I use for these 11 by 14s which are currently on sale right now. There's a link in the description. Signed, print. What I use is the Canon Image Prograph Pro 2100. I don't know why they call it 2100 because it prints 24 inch rolls of paper. Uh, but I'm sure that they've got a good reason for that. Uh, but this printer is quite phenomenal, actually. And the reason why I went for this particular printer is because having done the research, it seems like this one is a bit more economical with the ink. And when you spend thousands of dollars for a set of ink cartridges, you really want a printer that is economical with the ink. But I mean, it doesn't really matter which one you use. You can use Epson, HP, there's probably others that I don't know about. And you don't have to get anything of this size. You could get a much smaller printer. And if it's just a high quality printer, it will output images of comparable quality to this one. And of course they do bigger printers. But anyway, that's the reason why I wanted to go for this because I can put rolls of paper and print lots of prints all in one batch. The benefit that you'll have if you get something that is this size or, or larger is that you'll be able to do custom orders in-house. If I wanted to print an image that was 10 feet long, let's say a massive pano, I could do that because this prints on 24 inch rolls. Uh, but if you're not going to print anything that size or if you don't think you're going to be doing custom orders then the cost of this printer plus the ink is probably a bit much when you could get away with a smaller printer. Canon don't pay me anything to mention this. Uh, they don't even know I exist but you know if you're watching this Canon you know get in touch. Maybe we'll, we'll do a deal. Yeah. Oh if you are watching Canon um, what is this? What? This is crap. What is it? it? Seems like it's from a different era to the rest of the printer. Just you know, just an observation. I might be wrong. I might be using it totally wrong. If you know about this and you're watching, then just let me know what I'm doing wrong here because it's just a joke. Did you read the instructions? No, I didn't read the manual. <laughs> you don't think I'd forgotten about the book giveaway, did you? Well, sign up to the mailing list to enter the prize draw. There's a link in the description. And one winner gets the print, and one winner gets the book. Not both, you can't win both. That's just greedy. Now, one last thing that I should mention about this particular printer and many of the high quality photo printers out there that you might want to look for if you're thinking of printing your own images is get a printer that has both a matte black ink and a photo gloss black ink so that you can print on both matte papers which really soak up a lot of ink and also print on high gloss papers. I think most of them probably do do provide that these days but it's just worth looking into especially if you're buying an older used printer make sure you can do both of those options that's something that I really like about this particular printer. Now before we get on to the next bit just make sure that you stick around to the end because in this video I've included an interview with Dean McLeod and Dean is not just a fantastic photographer but he's also a specialist in very high-end luxury prints so I think you'll find it interesting to see what he has to say. Right, so let's talk about paper. So the paper that I really love to have my images printed on is photo speed. And the reason why I like photo... Oh, hang on, hang on. Someone's bloody phoning me. Hang on. It's photo speed. It's a bit weird. 
I think I know what he wants. Hang on. Toby, how are you doing, mate? Yeah. Uh, hi, Gavin. How are you liking the paper we sent you? Oh, yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, I was just talking about that, actually, in this video. It's kind of creepy and weird. Yeah, so I was just wondering when you were going to be paying us for the paper. P paying you, eh? Paper doesn't exactly grow on trees, especially when it's made from cotton. Well, I just thought it was free. Why? Because you're some kind of YouTube celebrity? Well, I, you know, I don't like the word celebrity, but uh, I, I just figured if I mentioned it in a video, you know, it'd be, it'd be free. Have you any idea how much it costs to ship paper all the way to Vancouver Island, Gavin? It's probably a lot, yeah. Yeah, it was a lot, Gavin. Uh, yeah, well, can we come to some sort of a deal? Well, I was thinking about approaching you to be one of the photo speed brand ambassadors. Yeah, yeah. Well, what, what does it involve then? Well, all brand ambassadors have to be passionate about and skilled in printing, have a good knowledge of colour management, and know how to take a decent picture. But we can let you off that last one. <laughs> yeah, all right, well, I could do that, yeah. Oh, Toby, don't forget he's got to do the uh, photo speed jingle. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm not doing a jingle, Toby. No. All you've got to sing is photo speed for every print. <sighs> oh, God. All right, yeah. Photo speed for every print. No, 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 no. Do it in falsetto. Foot, foot. Higher. Photo speed. Higher. Photo speed for every print. Good. Next time, we'll work on your vibrato. What have I become? So let's talk about how to display your prints. And you've got pretty much endless options. You've got standard retail picture frames that you can buy pretty much anywhere, quite affordably actually, uh, to acrylics or canvas prints, or even a, a framed and mounted print under glass, which can be quite expensive. So I reckon the easiest option is to just get standard retail frames from a big box store. So I got these from Michael's, but to be honest, you can get pretty good ones from even Ikea or Walmart. Uh, but what I went for with these was specifically, I wanted a very dark frame. So this one is black with a double black mount. That works really good for bright images. So because the frame and the mount are so dark, it makes the image pop out of the frame. And then you've got the exact opposite of that, where you've got an image that is actually quite dark, such as this nighttime image called Moonglow. Well, that works really good against an all white frame and mount. And then this image over here, well, if you look at the image itself, it features lots of black and white and then predominantly green. So that works well with a black and white frame. So when you have these kind of standard frames that work universally with pretty much any image, it makes it really easy to swap out the images every month or so and replace it with something fresh, you know, perhaps like a, a signed Gavin Hardcastle. There's a link in the description below. So these are a couple of your more expensive displaying options. So here we've got an acrylic. So this is a, a print underneath, I think it's a 1 8 acrylic glass. And yes, these are more expensive than just putting a print in a, a ready-made frame. However, they look absolutely fantastic and they come ready to hang. You don't have to get it mounted or framed. You just take it out of the packaging and stick it straight on the wall. But they're very, very glossy and shiny. And even when you get one that has matte glass, it still reflects, especially when you're in a room like this where there's windows over there and the light is kind of reflecting off the acrylic, which kind of interferes with your enjoyment of the image. So there's pros and cons to that, but if you've got good lighting and a nice space, acrylics can look absolutely dynamite. And then over here, this is a custom frame. And that's probably about the most expensive option that you could get. Actually, the most expensive option you could get would be an acrylic inside of a custom frame that would kind of get towards the higher end of what you'd want to pay but when you get a custom frame made you can actually get the mat and everything 
designed in a way that complements the image. So that's kind of towards the higher end of what you could do. You could spend thousands of dollars on custom molding around the edge of the image. It would look fantastic, but it starts to really get up there. Now, one thing I would recommend that you do when you do do custom framing and even with the ready-made retail frames that I just showed you back in Unicorn Labs is if you can take out the glass because I really enjoy seeing the image without any glare or any surface to look through it's completely pure and that's going to give you the best viewing experience however if you're in a household that's got like messy kids that might want to touch the print or perhaps you've got a pet camel that's got diarrhea then that could be a little bit risky because you don't want to ruin that exposed print. People have camels in their house with diarrhea. I'm sure that someone has a, a camel in their house and it has the squids somewhere. Or just kids. Because you know, kids, uh, kids are messy, you know, and they like to just touch stuff, don't they? Usually with poo on their hands. Yeah, so just a reminder that all of these signed prints are on sale right now. There's a link in the description. Uh, that's not going to be included in the sale. Did you uh, did you quit your other job? Mm, this is a special edition. It's it's not a special edition. Yeah, it's just it is. it's garbage. I'll practice. I'll get better. It's a postcard now. If you, uh, if you know anybody who's good with a guillotine, just uh, leave a comment below looking for a new worker. Right, so here's this interview that I did with Dean McLeod, a brilliant photographer and expert in luxury prints. I think you'll find this very interesting. So thanks for coming on, Dean. It's, it's a pleasure to have you on my show. Well, thanks for having me on, Gavin. Yeah, I've, uh, I think I've seen one of your YouTube videos. Well, I was uh, I was perving your website recently because we, we are Facebook friends oh. and um, some of your work pops up every now and then. And I always have to go and have a bit of a creep on your website and look at what it is that you offer. And some of the prints that you offer, I mean, obviously photography is excellent, but the way that you present it and the way that you, you market it on your website, it, it kind of explains straight away, okay, this is the sort of more higher end stuff. And that's that's where I want to go with my, my prints and my landscape photography. So let me give you a whole host of questions and hopefully you feel okay answering these and you're not giving away too many secrets. Would that be all right? Sure, sure, absolutely. Fire away, Gavin, yeah. So one of the challenges that I first came across when I started choosing images for my print gallery for this sale is everything I shoot is a three by two aspect ratio and most standard frames uh, like a, a, a four by five, it's almost a four by five crop. So I'd had to crop quite a lot of my images out to make them fit into standard sized frames. So I guess my question to you is, do you, do you care about that kind of thing? Or is it something that you just, you just make the, the image suit the composition and you just custom frame it every single time? I mean, most of the time I try to go with the standard two, three aspect ratio, you know, right out of the camera. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes you get home and open everything up on the computer after you've been out in the field and sometimes you just messed up your composition in the field. So you have to do some cropping, um, you know, so I do have some some shots on my website that are, you know, four by five, three by four, that kind of thing. But um, normally I try to stick to the two to three, you know, yeah. aspect ratio. And, and uh, if people want to frame, uh, all my stuff is custom framing anyway. So the aspect ratio doesn't really matter. Yeah. So yeah. you don't have to care about fitting into a pre-made frame because it's all custom. So yeah, so that answers my question. It's kind of, uh, it gives you a little bit more creative and artistic freedom when you don't have to worry about yeah. predefined sizes. It, it really does. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. Um, with the custom framing, I mean, it doesn't matter what the aspect ratio, yeah, the yeah. customer can do whatever they like. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally yeah. never mess up my compositions anyway. So let's move on to question two. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what types of images are your best sellers? Well, you know, everybody likes, uh, seems to like trees and waterfalls and mountains. You know, it seems to be popular, but 
What I found is just when you think you know what everybody likes, um, you don't. Yeah. Because uh, it, it's amazing sometimes. It can be a regional uh, interest if you have a, a customer that lives uh, on the coast. They might like coastal seascapes, that kind of thing. Um, or if they live in the prairie, they might like boats with old rustic barns, that kind of thing. So. It really depends, but I think the three fallbacks that everybody seems to like would, you know, be trees, mountains, and waterfalls, that kind of thing. But just when I think I know what everybody likes, you know, they order a big photo of a peacock. It is what it is, right? <laughs> I don't, I don't have any photos of, of peacocks. Uh, maybe I should start shooting those. I don't know, but it's pretty much what I thought you would say there. So no surprises there. That's that's kind of comforting to some degree. Right. Next question. Um, I noticed you offer spectacular framing options. So do most buyers like that? Or do you prefer, you know, a completely frameless acrylic that, or even a, a metal print that just sits on the wall that is not mounted, it's not framed? Like, I guess the question is, what do people tend to prefer the most when it comes to how to present the image? Probably the, the, the highest percentage of sales is, is frameless prints. Yeah. Um, you get the odd customer who wants something just amazing with the custom frame. So I do a few of those, of course, but mostly the frameless, whether it's an acrylic or a metal print, um, everything that I have on my website is ready to hang. So the frameless prints have recessed floating frames on the back. So they're ready to hang right out of the crate. So whether you go frameless or put a custom wood frame, you know, they're ready to hang, you know, so it's whatever the customer wants. But Mostly frameless, I would say, would be the largest amount yeah. of what I saw. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then, I mean, I like that too because it just doesn't it doesn't affect the image in any way. Your image is just a pure image hanging on a wall. That that's what I like. But um, yeah. And my next question then is, what types of sizes do you find the most common? Like, do people do people go for the huge prints, or are they still buying you know a, a fairly small eleven by fourteen or something like that? Are you having a, a print sale or something coming up, Gavin? Or well, you know, I'm just, just kind of curious. Yeah, I just, you know, it's uh, I'm just just picking your brains. You know, I think I think the audience might oh. get some benefit from these answers. Yeah. Okay. No, no fair enough. Um, yeah, I'd say probably the average order would be, you know, a mid size, say thirty by forty five. Kind of thing. Uh, some people go a little smaller, and then you get the odd customer who wants something ten feet wide and a triptych, you know, yeah. split up into three panels or something. So you sell a little bit of that too. So, but probably around the mid size, yeah. thirty to forty-five is probably the most common. I would really, think. maybe maybe a little bigger, forty by sixty. You well, know, that's interesting. Depending on who, yeah, depending on who you're targeting with your marketing, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. But. I guess yeah. you just, the best thing to do is just offer whatever sizes people, you know, stand, standard-ish sizes and then let them pick when they order, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's all on my website. So they just choose a size and go from there. Yeah. Yeah. But when you okay. sell your prints, do you do you get many of those just paper prints or is it mostly people want the finished product ready to hang whatever form that takes? Yeah, personally, I don't offer paper prints, not that there's anything wrong with them at all, but um, it's just, you know, kind of the niche market that I'm targeting. Um, you know, most folks are going for the metal prints or acrylic prints, that kind of thing. So, you know, uh, but like I say, I, I don't do the paper prints myself, not that there's anything wrong with that, but, you know, that's it's whatever you choose to do, right? Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think the way I feel about that is like the smaller stuff, I, you know, I think people probably would prefer that as paper because most people have, you know, frames for like an eight by 10 or a 11 by 14 and they're not that expensive. Right. So they could quite easily, you know, just take a print that you sold them on paper and just put that in. But I think once you start to get to the, the larger sizes, the physically larger sizes, you're really gonna have to get that either custom mounted and framed locally, which can be very expensive. Oh, you just give it to the yeah. just 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 give it to the photographer and say, okay, you you let me know how best to present this image. But I think on your website you offer a service where you kind of get 
them to send you pictures of their space and then you you kind of work with Photoshop to sort of give them a mock-up of how it might look and give them some options, right? Yeah, I, I find that's a, a really great tool to be able to uh, cust have a customer to see exactly what the print is going to look like on their own wall. They can just, you know, shoot me a cell phone photo of their room um, in an email and just let me know which image and what size they're thinking of and I can just do a mock-up to scale uh, so it'll give them a really good idea what it looks like on their wall uh, before they purchase you know so they just have that much more confidence in their purchase yeah. it's a great tool I get great comments and feedback on that all the time and people really seem to like that so yeah yeah and do you find that they, they typically go with what you suggest or is there a lot of back and forth and they say well can you try this can you, can you try that and different mount colors and all that kind of stuff yeah, sometimes when you send them a mock-up, they get kind of excited and then they want you to do 10 more. Yeah. Uh, so it can turn into a bit of a project. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I really don't mind doing that. You know, the customer is always number one. So, you know, I try to give people what they want. It's, it's what you got to do, right? Well, if you're spending that kind of money, I bloody well hope so. What what is the What is the average price of, let's say I did an acrylic that was like 50 inches wide, what does that usually come out at? Uh, probably like a 40 by 60 would be about, well, US, probably about 3000. Yeah. That US. doesn't, that doesn't sound unreasonable to me. Yeah. And I mean, so that, well, that's probably another question I should ask is like the pricing of things. I think <clears throat> there's two camps of people. The majority of people would probably say 3000, 4000 or upwards for a piece of art and, and kind of not, not get it. And then the small, there'd be a smaller percentage that would think, well, that's a bit cheap. You should be charging a bit more than that. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe I'll do a video about that because I think I did have this idea about doing an idea about the, uh, the cost of fine art photography. And if you tally right. up all of the costs involved in just creating the, the actual piece of art, so you're traveling, your equipment, your accommodation, and the number of times that you went to this location, perhaps you went there 60 times before you got that good light, you know, so all of this adds exactly. up, you know. Yeah, and it then really does, it really does. Yeah, it really does add up, you know, and you're exactly right. It's uh, the amount of money you have invested in equipment, uh, the amount you have to travel. I mean, if you want to make beautiful photos, you have to go to beautiful places. You know, I, I live in a landlocked province where there's not really anything but open wheat fields, you know, around me. I, I have to travel hours and hours really to get anywhere, you know, photo worthy that I think my clients would, you know, enjoy going to the mountains and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's so much that goes into it. Uh, the cost of having the prints made and shipped, I mean, that's all on, on me. So at the end of the day, you know, sometimes there's not a whole lot of pie left. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, that's why the price, you know, can get up there a little bit with fine art prints, but um, the results are amazing. They really are. And uh, people absolutely love them, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah. if you've got the space for that lovely large print, and if you have the light to, to shine on that image, you get abs I mean, when you see these in nice galleries, they're just absolutely spectacular. They're uh, breathtaking. They're breathtaking. You know, um, the good quality photo papers, you put a good accent light on them. They just light up like a TV screen and yeah. almost a holographic kind of 3D feel to them, you know, and just amazing. And people who have never seen prints like that in person are usually just blown away when they yeah. see them for the first time. It doesn't even compare to looking at a photo on a computer screen. Yeah, not even the same thing. You know, it's uh, it's a totally different world. And print, good printing is really an art unto itself. It really is. You know, so um, I, I recommend anybody uh, to to go to a gallery sometime and look at high end fine art photography and just see the difference. You know, it's uh, it's hard to explain unless you've actually seen one in person. Like every time there's a a photography display on at the local museum. Like here in Victoria, we had the Wildlife Photographer of the Year a few years ago, and it was brilliant. There's no way that I would ever spend that much time studying those images on my phone, on Instagram or whatever, 
But no, walking around a museum, a gallery, and and looking at these beautifully backlit images that are arranged perfectly, and just there's, there's lots of thought gone into how this is going to be displayed. It's a completely different right. experience, and I think for us as photographers, that's got to be the ultimate fulfillment of this passion that we have, right? Oh, it really is. So the end product of the print, you know, um, it's really kind of sad how so many photographers and enthusiasts uh, spend so much money on gear and 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 time to go photograph beautiful places, and then it all it just ends up on a hard drive and they're sharing it on social media, and that's as far as it ever goes. You know, it's it's really a shame. I you know I really recommend any photographer. To just just try it once, do a, a really good quality print of your work, and you just be blown away. It, it's com yeah. completely different than looking at it on a computer. That's for sure. It is. Yeah. I, I think I'm going to guess that probably what happens to most photographers when they do try that print for the first time is it comes out not looking anything like what they're used to on that illuminated computer screen. And so they've got this sense of disappointment and a lot of people probably just give up at that point. But as you and I both know, you have to do a completely different process of your image or at the very least tweak it somewhat to go from a you know a computer yeah. display to an actual piece of archival paper that's going to last for 85 years it's a different process and, and i've i've been i've been working quite hard at that to get all of these images ready for this, <laughs> this this print sale and it's it's taken a lot of time to get them to look on paper the way that i feel they should be seen so i mean i think most people who've experienced that and have probably thought oh i'm not going to do that again uh, I, I would say you know try again and, and put that little bit of time in and then the more you do it, the easier it gets, wouldn't you say? Very true. And I mean, as photographers, we're all used to using Photoshop and processing our images and, and having them come out the, the way we want on the computer. But when you try to transfer that file onto paper and make it look the same, it's a whole new ball game. Yeah. It's completely different. You do, you really do. You're exactly right. You couldn't have said it better. I mean, it's you have to process your photos entirely different. Uh, upsizing, sharpening, um, checking your color gamut to make sure you don't have colors out of gamut so that the print doesn't appear blotchy like in a colorful sunset sky, yeah. things like that. And uh, really a lot of trial and error that you really have to go through to uh, really figure it out. And that's why printing is really an art unto itself, completely different than just Photoshopping your images for the web. That's yeah. For sure. yeah, I'm learning all that now. And at first it was painful and frustrating. And then you, <laughs> you, know, you start to see these little improvements. And now I feel like I've got to a point where everything's coming out because it's so expensive. These inks are so expensive. I don't hit print until I feel very confident that <laughs> yeah. it's, it's going to come out the way it does. And I'm having quite, a good success rate. There's, there's the odd little surprise, but I've I've got them pretty pretty perfect now. But um, it's good to hear you're having some success with that. It's fun. I think that's the important thing. Uh, yeah. Let's see. I've got one last question. Uh, oh, the, I've got two questions. Okay, how do you go about signing your limited edition prints when they're made, you know, remotely somewhere else? Right. So what do I do? So all of my prints are limited edition. And that just helps um, protect the future value. Um, you know, if some photographers prefer to do open edition prints, um, but in the future, you know, if there's an unlimited number of them, that's really gonna affect the value. So everything's limited edition, but what I will do is uh, digitally embed my signature uh, with the edition number right uh, onto the file before it gets sent to the printer. Yeah. and. Then I'll send a certificate of authenticity, which is signed uh, by me with my own little pen and I send it to the client separately in the mail. So it all matches up when it arrives and uh, they can use that certificate for provenance. Have you got a nice yeah. little artistic signature or does it look like mine, like a spider fell in some ink? Mine is kind of legible. <laughs> um, but yeah, what I ended up doing was uh, writing it out on a piece of paper about a thousand times and then uh, scanning it and uh, putting it into Photoshop and just, just tweaking it and refining it, that kind of thing. Um, and just so I could make it look really pretty. But if you were asking me to reproduce the signature that you see on my photos 
uh, on a piece of paper, I couldn't do it. See, I, I've managed to get mine now, so it's almost the same every time because I did, I sent out nearly a thousand books, so I had to do all of those, every oh, single man. one of them. You, yeah, you must have a uh, your hand must be sore. There's yes. a bit of repetitive strain injury yeah, there. But, yeah, uh, I can see that happening. It's yeah. not nothing to do with the signing. Right, no. so what's the next question? <laughs> right. Um, do you ever shoot images that you know will sell well, even if you're not that into it? You know, luckily, most of the stuff that I enjoy shooting seems to resonate with my, my clients, you know? Um, I suppose after, you, like we were talking about before, after a while, you get some sales under your belt and you get a little bit of an idea what people like. Um, you might have a tendency to kind of shoot more of those scenes. Um, but then again, the next person orders the peacock, right? So <laughs> you really don't know what's going to happen. So, but no, I, I don't go really purposely and, and shoot scenes that, uh, that I know will sell well, um, in a way that will kind of draw you towards a lot of the iconic locations. Um, so then your photos look like everyone else's. You know, I try to do things a little bit differently. Even if I go to an iconic location, I'll try really hard to get a completely different composition or something really out of the ordinary that you wouldn't expect. People like what they like, and some people just want to have iconic images of places. And, uh, you know, you, you're probably smart to have some of those in your portfolio as well. Well, I think it's I think it's possible to do both. I think it's possible to please the crowd by yeah. giving them the greats, but also do it in a way that pleases you, so that you feel artistically fulfilled and yeah. you're proud of what you produce. You don't always have to just rock up and be lazy and stick your camera in the classic position. You know that there's a better way to do everything. So yeah, if you can yeah. if you can strike that perfect compromise of providing the popular locations, but do it your way, uh, I think that's the perfect scenario. Yeah, very true. And um, I don't know if you could see this photo behind me. I believe you have been there as well. Yeah. That's just doing something a little bit different. You know, um, I was lucky that when I was at Lower Lewis Falls, I went out and stood in the river. It was in August, so the water was only up to my ankles and you can get some different composition compositions that way. And um, I didn't even go around to the other side because that's the only time I had been there and I didn't even know that he could go around the other side. So. <laughs> It's kind of funny, you know, when you go to a place that you've never been before, uh, maybe you'll get lucky and come out with something that um, no one else has done. Um, and some, you know, what I've discovered over time is um, sometimes I on purpose will not look at any photos of a location before I go there. So I'm not biased and I'll just go and see it for myself the first time with my own eyes and just do my own thing. Um, and sometimes you just come away with something a little more unique that way, you know? That's a tricky, that's a tricky thing though, because uh, sometimes if, if you don't look to see what everybody else has done, bearing in mind that our, our default is to do something different, right? Right. You, you end up not knowing what to avoid. So it's like, if, if you go there with no prior research, you haven't seen any images, you might accidentally stumble into those same popular compositions. So, I mean, for me, I kind of go the opposite route. I kind of go like, okay, okay, I'll have a look. Right, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. But maybe if I go over there, I could get something, you know. Um, right. It's a, it's a tricky game that we play. True enough. Uh, that's a good point as well. You know, uh, all kinds of ways of looking at it. That's for sure. The big thing for me is trying to do things a little bit differently. I don't mind shooting icons. I mean, they're icons for a reason because yeah. they're so beautiful. You know, I don't mind going to Moraine Lake and climbing the rock pile at four in the morning to get a spot. Uh, it's been a few years since I've, I've done that, but um, because something like that is probably always going to sell well. But while I'm there, I try to do a few other different compositions as well and see what you can come up with and kind of work the scene. Sometimes that can be uh, an even bigger challenge is to visit an iconic place and try to come up with something really original. That can be sometimes even harder to do, you know? For example, Moraine Lake, like you just said there, I think often it, the light will dictate 
any opportunity that's different. You know, if, if you get crap light, you, your choices are limited. But like you yeah. said there, it's kind of look, looking for something unique if you're there. And then there's just this shaft of light way off on a, a mountain that's not even typically in the frame when you go to Marina. It's kind of behind you or just to the side. And you've got just this shaft of light. You're right. If you then have that telephoto lens, you, you, you can seize that opportunity and get that shot. But if you don't go, you, you're never going to get any shot, are you? Yeah, that's why you're right. You have to be aware of your surroundings and not just uh, put the blinders on and look look at that main composition. Look around when you're there because, as you know, I mean, especially in the mountains, the weather changes by the minute yeah. and uh, you don't know what you're going to get. You could arrive in the rain and 15 minutes later it's sunshine. You yeah. know, you don't know what you're going to get. So, And that's sure. why we love what we do, right? Because of those little surprises that we get. It keeps me going back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this has been really useful. I, I got some useful information there. Hopefully the audience got some useful information there if they're thinking about doing their own prints. Um, is there anything that you want to mention? I mean, bear in mind, I'm having my own print sale now. So like if you try and sell your own prints, that's could be a bit rude. Well, you know, um, I think I would just recommend that photographers really try printing their work. You know, try printing it yourself and then maybe hire a, a printer, outsource it and just see what they can do yeah. with the same file. And that will kind of help you learn a little bit as well. But at the end of the day, there's nothing better than a, a big, beautiful, bold, colorful print hanging on your wall. It is just nothing like looking at it on a computer screen. And uh, they last for generations too, you know. So printing, I absolutely love it. It's the way to go. I, I wish you luck on your uh, your print sale there. Yeah, I'll, I'll sure. give you yeah. you know I'll give you a special discount because you you know you gave me all this advice. So I'll, I'll email you like a discount code if you you know because then you could maybe put something really tasty on that back wall over there, maybe the other side of that waterfall that you didn't go to because I did. Uh, yeah, well, I've got a couple of uh, little spots here that might work out in yeah. this room. Maybe yeah. Huh. Yeah, sure. No, I really? appreciate that, guy. Yeah. All right, mate. Well, uh, thanks for coming on and. Uh, Hopefully we'll get to together at some point and go and shoot for reels together somewhere in the mountains. Oh, I'd love it. I'd love it. I'll give you a call next time I'm out on the island. I'll bring my rain gear. Yes, <laughs> do that. That'd be. I'd love to go shooting with you. And I'm trying to plan this cross Canada trip this year, which I don't know if it's going to happen because of the restrictions. But if it does, uh, then I'll be passing by your place at some point. Like how close are you to the route that most people drive through Canada? Are you way up north? I am a little bit north of that, probably about two and a half hour drive, you know, but if you come through Saskatchewan, we have all the great towns you can visit. And I don't know what they were thinking when they named them, but we have Moose Jaw. Yeah. Um, Climax. <laughs> um, Big Beaver is a great town. And of course, our uh, capital city, Regina. What kind of a show do you yeah. think this is, Steve? This is, you know... You know, that they were all named before I was born, so I don't know what they were thinking, but it is what it is. That's where I live. So. I didn't realize that Canada was so smutty, but now, now I'm learning. <laughs> no, it's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, let's get together soon and, and uh, do this in person. Let's make it happen. Absolutely, my friend. Why? Because you're some kind of YouTube celebrity? <laughs> Oh, that was uh, brilliant. It. it was a lot, Gavin. <laughs> Come on. Have you any idea how much it costs to ship paper all the way to Vancouver Island, Gavin? <laughs> Sorry. That was so good. I can't. Nah, I want to hear it in falsetto. <laughs> I'll bet you do. Oh, <laughs> Higher. <laughs> Sorry. Now, I'll, I'll do it again. I need to look like I'm crying and dying inside. <laughs> okay. You sound like you're dying inside. <laughs> <laughs>